Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all finding ourselves together on our Zoom meeting and welcome to our 2020 annual membership meeting of the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area. Let me welcome not only our members at large um, from across the area, Washington, DC, Virginia, and Maryland, but also to our board members. And I believe in our audience today, this includes our past presidents um, who are Eddie Dick, Ed Almondorf, Karen Mulhauser and Don Bliss. I'm sure they're joining us vicariously or virtually as well. We also have a number of our advisory council members joining us. We have many special donors and partner organizations represented in the meeting this afternoon. As I think you know, this chapter is a group of some 1,200 people across the area and one of the largest of the 200 chapters of the United Nations Association of the United States of America. I'm so glad you could take the time to join us even in this virtual style. It's almost reality for many of us, um, thinking only a few months ago when we began to do this. Today, this is occurring on the same year in our meeting as the United Nations 75th anniversary. That's in 1945. And in October of 2020, we'll be celebrating the beginning of the UN. And in fact, um, shortly on the end of this week, we'll be celebrating the signing of the United Nations Charter. Um, which was on June 26th. You know, then when it was founded, then the world was a very crucial turning point in 1945, bringing all nations around the world together to start a new lasting peace in the world after World War II. Today, I actually think we're in another crucial point to make a better world of the multilateral mutual cooperation among all peoples and nations that makes a global reality, the full respect of everyone's human rights. We're now at a crucial turning point with the opportunity to share openly our resources, knowledges, and technology across the world to be in a position to stop future pandemics and to end the historically high displacement of over 100 people from their homes due to war, autocratic leaders, and to climate change, among other reasons. To accomplish these goals, we must seek and support national leaders who will seek cooperation, and I underline the word cooperation, to fully implement the sustainable development goals for equal social, economic, and long-term environmental protection to turn the tide against global warming. We can no longer tolerate national policies anywhere in the world and in our own country that undermine the human rights for economic opportunity and long-term health of our black citizens and other minorities whose rights have been and are still systematically discriminated against. In this meeting today, together, our members, we are having a discussion about both the local and global needs to address the pain and suffering of many people of color being systematically discriminated against in what we thought was this modern age after 400 years of work to try to avoid this. Before that, our president, Paula Boland, is going to present the highlights of our annual 2019-2020 annual review report which was released today, and I hope you may have received an email in the last four or five hours. And before that, our president will also um, then be prepared to turn this over to the panel, um, which I'm gonna introduce shortly. Then following the panel discussion, the election results for future leadership and officers and at-large board members will be presented by the board nomination committee chair, Sultana Ali. And then I'll have a chance to thank those outgoing board members and officers who are completing their terms as of today, our annual meeting. And finally, we'll be hearing briefly from our new board chair, who will work closely with me and Paula and the rest of the board as we make the transition from me to the new board chair over the course of 2020 to our June 21 meeting, which I hope will not be on a virtual basis, but will be together again in June of 2021. I want to express our sincere thanks to so many of you for not only your advice, for your guidance, and extraordinary levels of volunteer services on which this organization wholly depends. But also thank you for your very generous support, both for the current and past year, and also the long-term commitments to our legacy circle and our reserve endowment fund set up some years ago. Frankly, your support on a continuous basis every year consistently has enabled us to balance our budget 
every year for the past five years. Thank you so much. I want to make a special note, though, about the endowment initiative. As of early June 2020, that's this month, UNA NCA has received pledges totaling just over $230,000 from several UNA leaders and their families, including the founders of the UNA NCA Florence Pepper Shot Endowment. We're hoping that commitments, which could total as much as $250,000 to $300,000, can be achieved by the end of 2020 so that we can talk about this year as completing our endowment goals under the UN 75th birthday. So thank you for considering this, and thank you those families who've already made such substantial donations, and for the many of you who have made very substantial donations to our operating funds. I now have the pleasure to present Paula Bolin, our executive director for the past 10 years. A pleasure to work with her. In accordance with the membership approval of our bylaws changes earlier this month, Paula has been appointed to be the new president of our association. Those bylaw changes also made the change from me as president to be board chair and the other vice presidents to become now the board vice chairs. Sounds complicated, but it's basically a move to recognize the important role that our executive director has played in a very executive capacity, certainly deserving of being called the president. And we're looking forward to the years ahead with her as president. A special note, I would like to also announce that last week, Paula had a double opportunity. She was elected as chair of the National Advisory Council for the United States um, Association of the United Nations Association, so countrywide. So thank you very much. And I look forward to speaking with you again later after the panel. Paula? Thank you very much, Steve. And good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks for joining our 2020 annual membership meeting. Who knew we would be gathering virtually? I think the first time in the UNA history that we're doing an annual meeting in a virtual way and having such a great turnout. I want to start by thanking our leaders on the board executive committee, advisory council, program committees, as well as our volunteers, donors, and staff for your incredible hard work and support this past year, and particularly during this unprecedented time. While scary and filled with uncertainty, we stick together and creatively adjusted our programs to virtual platforms, brought new programming, and expanded our reach within and beyond our jurisdiction. I could not be prouder. Seizing the moment and opportunities, as Bob Orr said recently to our graduate fellows, in the midst of challenges has certainly been our motto and it has served us well, one that we will build upon in the month to come. As Steve said, this is a very important year. It marks the 75th anniversary of the UN, Global challenges have never been in greater need for a strong, stronger global response from the international community. And it has never been more critical for the US to claim back its leadership role and seat at the table. Our mission of educating and mobilizing Americans for a strong US-UN partnership along with over 20,000 UNA-USA members across the country has never been more relevant. I am honored to be able to serve UNA, NCA, and UNA, USA in the new capacities. This is a critical moment for our movement. And this is the decade of action. The UN Secretary General call us all for action, for our voices to be heard, for us to help achieve the development, the sustainable development goals. Second, we expanded our outreach in programmatic areas, bringing the global and local dimensions throughout the year. We expanded our advocacy reach and engage our congressional and state representatives through new digital materials, targeted actions such as the one um, we had during World Health Day to support WHO, training opportunities and policy briefings. I hope you are all participating in this week's uh, Week of Action United Together campaign that UNA USA has uh, prepared for us. This past year saw a variety of timely and well-attended programs addressing the climate 
climate agenda, human rights, peace building, public health, and much more. And recently, through our newly Coffee Chat series, which experienced record participation through informal discussions of timely topics and engaging several stakeholders and bringing new partnership collaborations. So um, my thanks to all of our program committee leaders and staff uh, for this wonderful programmatic uh, achievements throughout the year. Our year-round global education program, known as Global Classrooms DC, had a strong year as well. And despite having to cancel its Spring Model UN Conference, it was able to reach over 1,000 participants, offered virtual sessions, and renewed the support of its stakeholders. We had an excellent cohort of graduate fellows from local universities who benefited from a strong curriculum and experts, as well as professional development and mentoring opportunities. Special thanks to our graduate fellows uh, team. Our young professionals program continued to provide leadership and professional development opportunities through its career dinner series, and most recently through virtual uh, programming. Our Human Rights Committee played a critical role in collecting feedback from our local stakeholders and produced two shadow reports on the state of human rights in DC, as well as on gender. And these reports have been submitted as part of the universal periodic review process. Uh, and most recently, uh, and in partnership with UNA USA and our advisory council, we participated in UN 75 consultation. Um, the, the results of these uh, engagements are all being collected in one report that UNA USA will be submitting uh, to the Secretary General uh, for the General Assembly in September. So that's just a summary of some of the key highlights uh, on a programmatic level. And you will find all the details in our annual reports, the overall annual report, as well as the one that we put together for Global Classrooms. Uh, I invite you to, to look at them. They're now posted on our website and we will also send it as follow-ups to all of you. On the operations side, UNANCA is in a very solid financial position had a balanced budget in 2019, strengthened its operational reserves significantly, and as Steve mentioned, long-term investments. I want to thank our finance and development teams for their steady work in helping strengthen our financial sustainability. We received also in the past few months a small um, loan grant um, a part of the, the payroll protection program to help cover some of the revenue loss that we had as a consequence of canceling some of our programs. But that was an important achievement for us. Um, we had important staff transitions and built a strong team of which I couldn't be proud of. Thank you so much, Andrew Dahl, Shane Weiser, and Jaya Lala, as well as our past GCDC director, Nicole Bohano, who I believe is joining us uh, this afternoon for her leadership of the GCDC program for the last three years. Uh, we're gonna miss you, we already miss you, and we wish you luck in your next journey. Many thanks as well to our governance committee and bylaws uh, chair for their work updating the bylaws to reflect current practices and as well as best practices, and to the nominating team led by Sultana for bringing an outstanding and diverse group of new leaders with whom I very much look forward to uh, work with. So this is just a, a glimpse of what you are going to find in much more details in the annual reports, which I invite you to, to look at. Um, let's please continue to stand up and make our voices heard. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Everyone plays an important role in UNA. You all bring time, resources, connections, ideas. Uh, these achievements are possible because we're coming together now more than ever before. Um, the UN is doing its part to standing up for the world. We need to stand up for the UN. There's a lot at stake, but I believe in the people's movement and that's what we are. We are part of that people's movement. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. I look forward to continue working with you in these new capacities. And um, 
now we're going to proceed to uh, have Steve introduce our moderator for the next session of the program. And I just want to remind you that uh, we are going to be taking your questions using the uh, question and, uh, and answer chat in the bottom of your screen. Uh, those questions will be compiled and shared with our moderator. So without further ado, thank you so much and stay in touch. Paula, thank you so much for that excellent report and thanks to your whole team for putting that report together under circumstances that are not ideal. You can imagine that putting together an annual report from five or six different locations across the city. It's an outstanding performance. We've now been under lock and key, so to speak, for three months. And I must say the participation rates of all of you who are members and officers and collaborators and partner organizations has increased dramatically and substantially during those three months. We were worried we might lose you or you would lose us. But I have <laughs> to say it's gone just to the reverse, I think because of the substance and the alacrity with which we have transformed into a virtual delivery. Let me know I have a great pleasure of introducing a board member of ours who is the president and executive director of the Global Health Council. That's Lois Pace. Lois has an extraordinary career working across countries at the ground level and all kinds of public health endeavors. She holds a, a master's degree from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She served previously in a, quite a number of well-known organizations in different policy capacities, advocacy capacities. These include the Lives, the Lives Strong Foundation, American Cancer Society, Physicians for Human Rights, the Catholic Relief Services, so she's a well-known figure on the path to advocacy and policy change. And we're just delighted that she's agreed to not only continue as a board member, but to moderate this really significant panel. Lois, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. And congratulations to you and Bala on another great year. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to serve on the board with, with all of you. Um, and it's, it's also my pleasure to be with 30-plus um, attendees, it looks like, this evening. So. Um, I am uh, grateful to be able to kick us off um, with this conversation, a very important one that we're um, hoping to have tonight on uh, current events. As Steve mentioned in his opening remarks, we really are at a turning point in this country um, with our conversation on race and racism. And so i um, thrilled that UNANCA has taken up uh, the charge in advancing this conversation. And I think that uh, rightfully, this is just one in a series of discussions I know are taking place uh, both formally and informally, not just in our chapter and across our region, but uh, in chapters around the country. And, and I understand something that uh, UNA um, USA has really taken hold of as a priority uh, for them as well. So uh, hopefully we can all gain a lot um, from this discussion tonight with the panel that we have joining me. And with that, I'd invite them to uh, start their videos if they haven't already while I introduce them. Um, first off, we have in no particular order, uh, Tanya Wellens, who's the president and CEO of the Greater Washington Community Foundation uh, here in DC. Uh, we have George Jones, who's also president and CEO of Bread for the City here in Washington. And then finally, we have Una Nelson, who's a student at Howard University, Go Bison, and also um, a UNA NCA representative to the National Council. So um, with that, uh, I will make sure everyone is on and then kick us off. Welcome, welcome. Great, terrific. Well, it's happy to have all of you joining us this evening. Um, and for those of you who don't um, know my style, I like to keep things conversational. I recognize that we're close to the end of everyone's day. We want to keep everyone awake and energized. And so, uh, as Paula said, uh, it would be great if people could go ahead and submit their own questions for me. Uh, to pose to the panelists, but um, I think we're just going to get going and see where the conversation takes us, uh, and hopefully um, we'll hear from you all uh, in the audience joining us shortly. So uh, again, this conversation really about uh, what we can all do to uh, more fully and meaningfully confront this issue of racism that's bubbling up for us. It isn't the first time, of course, that 
America has struggled with racism and, mm -hmm. uh, and the sort of consequences or very public aftermath thereof. There have been numerous times in our history where things have, um, this issue has truly bubbled to the surface, but I think we can count this as one more instance. And so um, with that in mind, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very um, cognizant of sort of the long arc that, that, that this, um, this issue has taken, you know, this long road traveled um, for this particular um, 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 sort of uh, priority in our country. And so I think um, with that, I want to have a conversation really keeping in mind the long history of racism and then um, obviously sort of the long road ahead as a result. Um, but I, I also want to be sure that we're not just talking at too high a level, that we're not just talking about say what the U.S. could do or even what the U.N. could do. Um, I want to be sure that everyone here, um, and I'm not just speaking to my, our panel, but um, to all of you looking at me now, I, I want to be sure that this is a conversation about personal um, action and responsibility. So not just something at the institutional, but the individual level as well. Um, with those caveats or, you know, pieces of my introduction, I think my, my first question to the panel overall um, that I'd like each of you to, to answer is really um, just kind of how you're feeling in this moment, right? I mean, the entire world now um, is, is watching the U.S. grapple quite publicly um, with the recent police brutality um, and other acts of violence against Black Americans. Um, you've seen our country rise up. You've seen rallies um, really take place all over the world. Um, and it's been quite um, captivating uh, and, and, and arguably moving. But I, I don't want to tip the scales too much with my opinion of what's happening. I'd love to hear you what you think. So maybe I'll start with with, with George and, and work my way, work my way back. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that, um, and I'm not the first person to say this, that we are, and in my mind, we are having a moment that is historical. Um, and um, uh, as, uh, as the play Hamilton says, I think history has its eyes on us as we look to sort of tackle of this and I think this is just the greatest opportunity we've had to uh, address racial uh, inequity and racism since the 1960s. I, I think that for many of us who are in this space, I've been working in the social justice space for almost 40 years now. This is the moment we've been waiting for, uh, and so I am, to be quite honest with you, quite thrilled and exhilarated about this. What I think is once in a lifetime opportunity to really do something to move um, the needle, to put it in a cliche way, around sort of racial justice and racial equity. Thanks, and Tanya. Um, absolutely. You know, um, I've been calling this the sort of the trifecta of crises. Um, you know, at least we forget that we're in the middle of a global health pandemic. Uh, an economic crisis and a crisis of, um, of democracy, all of which have um, the underpinning of, of racial inequity uh, and bias. Um, you know, I think there's some things when it, as it relates to the, the crisis of, of, you know, of leadership in all of these that we should absolutely, um, as a country with the spotlight on us from around the world, be completely embarrassed by. Um, you know, I, I, my, I brought some friends around the world and the, 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 the response that I received this morning was just that countries like um, the UK, um, the Caribbean, many countries in the Caribbean were thinking about sort of banning U.S. travelers, even as they began to open up. Um, and I, I think it speaks to um, the carelessness with which we've treated or responded to the global health pandemic. Um, it also means that, um, you know, we're going to be in the, in the economic crisis for a much longer period of time. Um, but to George's point, were the world not still um, and all of these things happening at once, I'm not sure that we'd be able to focus our eyes or be so laser focused, have the time, the attention, the bandwidth um, to lean in to the cause of social justice um, and racial equity that we're in right now. So like George, 
I am um, hopefully optimistic. A little bit tired because you know we were, we were working so hard um, to respond in a timely way to COVID. Um, but I'm energized because um, I, I think my my role, um, especially now for our community, is to is to figure out how we fund the movement, to figure out how we support the movement by moving resources to people um, who can use them to continue to to push the agenda forward. Great, thanks for that, Luna. So both of you made some pretty um, great points. Tanya, I want to reiterate what you said about I trifecta crises. Just what a play on words right there. It makes me feel like I've been transported back to the times of the Spanish flu, the 1960 civil rights movement, and um, either the 2007 um, economic crash or the Great Depression. So we have about four major time periods right now in not even half the year. And honestly, it's very overwhelming. I didn't even graduate college yet, and there's already another economic crisis on the way. Um, we hear about, or read about in school about the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and the riots, and the watchdogs, and the hoses, and the brutality of people just trying to exercise their right to protest. And then right now, I'm seeing the same thing happen in real life. So. It's so some part of me feels like I'm living in a movie that was curated based on historical fiction. It doesn't seem real. It seems like it, it was made up in somebody's head. And so for me, I feel overwhelmed. And right now I'm doing the best I can to learn and absorb all this information that honestly I did not learn in school. You guys have, George, you were saying 40 plus Sorry, Una, I think we've we've lost you. It was so compelling. Social justice service to catch up. I want to, can you hear me now? Wait, am I back? You're back. <laughs> I'm back, okay, sure. Um, I think I left off on how I'm just trying to catch up, making sure I'm as educated as possible during this time because there's so much they don't tell you in school. And we need to be educated in this time because we can't repeat the same mistakes or we have to be able to recognize the mistakes that was made in the 1960s right? civil rights movement. We have to be able to call out our government when something's wrong. Why is this being repeated when we just saw this issue um, not even a couple decades ago. What, what, what's missing here? And I think from people around my age, people just graduating college, grad school, I just turned 20, so early 20s, that time where it's so pivotal, where we're able to soak up a lot of information. This time, I really do have hope that this is that pivotal. Sorry, Una. But I have to, especially for my generation, read articles, read books, um, understand who you're voting for in terms of elections. That's super important and how important local elections are. I yeah. encourage my people to vote and I encourage them to take action more than they have before. We support businesses that are not um, funding super PACs or corporations or swaying government um, policy making. That's something yeah. you don't think about, but how we spend our dollar has a huge, huge influence in how we live our lives. As, mm -hmm, and that was something where you kind of know in the back of your head, but when I did more research and finding out how the everyday um, McDonald's or, I don't know, Walmart are supporting in initiatives or issues that I do not support. Mm -hmm. no, I, it I think that's a really, I mean, Una, I, I can really appreciate how, you know, I felt like there was a volley that happened where Tanya's like, I'm exhausted, but energized. And then boom, here comes Una with all the energy saying, yeah, no, I'm ready to roll. And I... I can really appreciate the, the historical context that each of you brought, right? Um, I mean, my, my, my mother picked cotton, she integrated her high school, she, and I turn to her sometimes in these moments and I ask, how are you managing this? How should I manage this? Because you lived through all those things, you know, growing up in Tennessee, my dad's from Alabama, they've seen some things. And, uh, and you know, this, this idea that we can, we don't have to be in despair, we can certainly be exhausted because it has been a long road, but yet, you know, there's so much we can learn from the people who traveled this road before us. I think that's a really powerful message. Um, Una, I want to stay with you um, because I, you know, we have a question that's come in and it, it matches a, a, a question similar to, to what I had, which is, you know, well, well, who else can teach us in this moment? And, and I think specifically it's 
what role could or should the United Nations be playing for the U.S.? I mean, so often we have this um, kind of question or assumption in reverse that the U.S. has so much to offer the world in terms of democracy or economy or, you know, health, right? And yet here we are facing this very real uh, social or civil crisis. Do you have thoughts, especially given your role um, as uh, on our National Council, um, what the United Nations should be doing or saying specifically in light of the statements they've already made, the hearings they've already had, what more do you recommend um, should be happening between the two? Okay, thank you for suggesting that. So I was saying how we all know that the, U the U.S. is the U.N.'s biggest supporter financially. And before the U.N. made its statement, I'm thinking, oh, no, is there going to be some kind of bias or hesitancy because they're afraid that the U the U.S. will pull funding, which they've already done, and they already pulled out of who? And so that concerned me. So it really gave me a lot more hope when um, the Secretary General condemned a lot of the human rights violations in the U.S. I think we have to understand that the U.S. in particular, yes, you do have a lot of influence at the U.N. because you do support it financially the most, but you signed up as a member of the UN for an unbiased opinion on how you govern. And we need to take that responsibility responsibility seriously because we're, we're giving, we're, we're financially supporting the UN because we trust in its entity, we trust in their judgment and we trust the opinions of what they have to say about not only the US but amongst the world. And so I think that the UN has every right to condemn the U.S. on a human rights issue because the U.S., when they sign up, when they're donating money, they are, they're saying, we are going to accept your opinion if you, and your expertise, if you think that we have some issues to work out in terms of our governance. And I, I really hope the U.S. kind of takes what the U.N. has to say fairly under consideration because now, now it's not just um, the citizens speaking up. You have a whole international entity speaking up an unbiased opinion, an opinion that is supposed to be the voice of human rights and civil rights matters across the globe. And so I think the U.S. really needs to take that seriously and not just think because they, they support it financially that they have more leeway to kind of push it off or push it to the side. I think what the U.N. is saying is very important. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Tanya, interested in your thoughts too. I mean, you, you referenced having friends uh, abroad. What, what's your take on what the U.N. should be doing? Well, um, it's interesting in, in thinking about what I could offer. Hold on one quick second. The interesting journey of working at home, um, lots of kids in your house. So I apologize for that. Um, but when I was preparing my remarks for, for today, I was thinking back, back over my career. So I spent most of my career in international development. Um, and as you said, Lois, um, we were the, the teacher. Uh, and I think now, now it's the student. When I was a, a junior in college, um, I worked in Colombo, Sri Lanka for USAID and their democracy and governance team. And I looked at you know, human rights abuses, um, strengthened rule of law, uh, the relationship between the sort of the, the rebel minorities and the, and the rest of the, the population. Um, I worked as a, um, an intern for the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements in 1996, where housing was the global issue of the day. Um, five years in post-apartheid South Africa, where we were really looking at how do you build a pipeline of next generation leaders in that country um, to be able to you know, respond to all of the vestiges of apartheid. Eight years at the World Bank Group, on financial inclusion and financial access, particularly looking at how poor people uh, around the world have been locked out of the financial, um, financial services sector. And then two years at Peace Corps um, on you know, peace, peace, friendship, and locally organized community development. And if you think about all the things that we need to focus on as a country uh, right now, housing, uh, economic justice, uh, free press, you know, sort of the strengthened rule of law, um, sort of this balance of human rights and human rights issues, um, sort of the, the, the financial access and financial inclusion, um, peace, friendship, uh, you know, they're all the same things. And, it, and it's a, such an interesting juxtaposition uh, around, again, being the 
teacher in one period and, and the student um, in the other. I think the opportunity is thinking through, you know, our, our connected struggles um, sort of globally um, and sort of the return to print the principles and ideals that this country was founded on. And the implementation flawed, of course, because it did not include uh, Native or uh, Indigenous or, or African Americans in the sort of the ideals or the framing. But the framing in and of itself has, um, I think, a unique opportunity to really live out its, um, its true, its core values, its, its core value. Um, I think there's an opportunity, and if we think about the rise and fall of places, um, and, and even in our recent history, we can look at Bosnia, we can look at Rwanda, we can look at South Africa, where things fell apart, but they had to fall apart in order to, uh, to build them in a way um, that was more, uh, more equitable and more just. Uh, I think that's the place that we are now, and the international community has to hold us to account uh, in order for us to really uh, you know, push or push forward for, for meaningful change. Yeah, there's something to be said for building back better. And I keep hearing that term, you know, coming back to the trifecta of issues, right? Like how, how do we actually build back a health system that can survive a crisis, um, you know, not just in the U.S., but worldwide? How do we also, though, apply that to our economy, potentially, right? Make it so that people aren't making so little, um, as Una was, was alluding to earlier. Um, and her staunch advocacy so that they're not just sort of paycheck to paycheck, not just making away it. from poverty. Absolutely. Yeah. And then like, finally with this, with this idea of our, our social contract too, you know, it, 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 you're right. It wasn't, it wasn't completely done right. Right. And we've been trying to like tinker around the edges for the, the hundreds of years we've been in existence as a country, whether that's been for women or for people of color, but for, 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 for indigenous peoples, but know really like how do we get it right Absolutely. <laughs> now uh, we're not back here again in you know 20 30 more years that's a you know it's a really critical question I appreciate you both of your um, uh, I'm glad that you <laughs> And I know, uh, oh, some things, but, was, but I think it's important for people to understand the, the richness of your experience and how you, honestly, how you straddled the two. Um, it's a unique experience, I think, to, to have both such rich um, international, um, oh, not just awareness, but, um, but activity, um, and, and yet be, be as committed as you are to, to, to the work that you're doing. I, pre I presume the U.S. is your home, but you know, it's your home. Okay. Um, no, so I, I, you sorry. It is. It is. Yep. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I guess I want to, you know, I want to actually ask how you, how you've reconciled that, even just personally, yeah. right? Um, you know, there's one question about like how the U.S. is thinking about student teacher and like these roles that it's played over time, but even for you, are you, you know, feeling this disconnect mm. in this moment yourself <laughs> about your role or experience in the U.S. versus abroad or, you know, is there some sort of natural synergy um, 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 that you're finding in this moment? I think that could be helpful for others who might be feeling, I don't know, maybe a bit unsettled, right, by yeah. this, that what seems like a sudden shift. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, because I've, I have done this, this straddle of, you know, hyper-local focus U.S. and then you know, everything in, in international development is also local, you know, as much as it is global, when you're, when you're really doing uh, work, you're doing it at a community level. And the, and the systems that you're trying to impact and affect are all the same systems. It's local government, typically, or sometimes provincial government. It's the private sector, uh, it's NGOs, and then it's, to some extent, philanthropy. Um, these are the same systems that we're trying to to move, to advance, to align um, domestically now. Like all the work that, and, and, I, and I'm happy to share this panel with George, because if I, um, I'm in philanthropy, he runs a, an, an important nonprofit. But when I need something done or I need to check a reference about whether this is the way that philanthropy ought to be moving, I gotta call people who, are, who have an ear to the ground and who understand really what's happening. Um, at the same time, 
you know, I'm, I'm checking in with our colleagues and our peers in local government to say, you know, um, we, we can fund this, this could offer a bit of, you know, catalytic resources that government might pick up to, to further. So I think that the systems are the same. Um, it is very tricky to, to stay connected um, in the international development space and in the local community development space at the same time. Like I really have not in the last um, four years been able to really pay that, you know, like close attention. Like when I was a Peace Corps, I was all in, you know, and the moment I moved from Peace Corps to, to local community development, my entire focus has had to shift here. Um, but because you understand how these systems work um, and because of like the unique and unfortunate nature of where we are right now, um, it is important, one, that, you know, the, 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 the institutions and systems like the World Health Organization that we have had relationships with and been a part of for so many years that we're where those things are breaking and falling apart that we just have to we have to really ride this thing out um, those of us who care will return to you know an active US participation in, di di in diplomatic spaces because um, we know how important they are like we're just in a period right now of unfortunate um, uh, lack of leadership when it comes to um, sort of the, the global importance of the global stature of the United States, which is why I think it's all the more important that um, that the world not let us off easy. Um, they can't let us off easy because we we're, we're just too um, yeah. We just, they, the world can't let us off easy. I don't know if that answered your question. No, I can appreciate that. You just sort of I was letting it sit for a little bit, <laughs> getting my pen so I can write that down. Um, but George, you know, I mean, you, she, she, she called you into this and, and I think it is fitting for you to respond to this, this question of straddling as well. Um, how have you reconciled the two or how are, how are you viewing this as someone on the front lines as, as Tanya was saying, you know, everything global is local, right? All social justice is really happening on the ground, on the front lines, in our communities, in our backyards. So, you know, as you are, I mean, you've been a recipient of our Human Rights Award in years past, and so you're, you know, well aware of, like, the human rights context and where y'all work, and yet you, you know, you tackle that on a daily basis. Are you heartened um, by this, you know, recognition that the two are one and the same? Uh, you know, do you have any other insights now that we're, we're in this moment? Well, I don't think it's going to surprise anybody. I think people know that um, the, the challenges that we, you know, there's a saying about racism in America. We didn't invent it, but we perfected it in this country. Uh, and, and so it isn't unique to us. And in fact, it, again, it didn't start in this country. And so I think, yes, the rest of the world has every right to sort of, you know, call America out because we have sort of, uh, you know, portrayed ourselves as being this beacon of freedom and, you know, and equality and, and justice. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, we've always fallen short of that. Uh, and even as a one who's only worked domestically, I've always been aware of that. And as one who really has a, a kind of, um, like many African Americans have, you know, I, I suspect, you know, I have a real strong um, interest in what happens in Africa and what ha what's happened, the kinds of injustices that play themselves out there. So I've always been aware of that. In fact, I've long thought that my last foray into this work would be in Africa and you know, a chance to sort of get back to the motherland, so to speak. So, so there, there's a connection and there's a, there's a, there's a legacy of, of both sort of the evolution of justice in the world that America has been a part of, but the leg unfortunately the legacy of racism and oppression of people of color and black people in particular that this country has been a part of, but so has England and so have so, has so many countries in the, in the world. And so I hope that those countries who are calling us out were rightfully so, also, you know, the truth of the matter about racial equity is that we all have to start at home and talk about what's going on in our own lives and our own households and in our own countries and our own organizations. At Bradford, the city, when we started eight years ago to look at racism uh, and, and its place in, in, in the work we do in the social justice work, we had to look internally. You know, almost every system in this country, if not every system in this country, has been socialized to be a racist system. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's been led, it's being led by a black person or not. The systems that when people talk about systemic racism, what they're talking about is the really the adoption of some version 
of the original systems that were set up 400 years ago. And we've, you know, we've sort of reformed them to some degree. In, in the best instances, there's been some reform, but in too many instances, it's just been some transformation of them into something, you know, something that is new and, and sometimes improved or new and veiled. And so when I think of, again, when I think about the domestic work, I think about, uh, like as Tonya said, you know, it starts, it's all local. And in, and in a way it's all local in terms of what's happening in your own institutions. Uh, and I think, in, you know, internationally, in all the countries, I mean, the whole world has to pledge to become an anti-racist planet. Uh, you know, we need an anti-racist city, country, and an anti-racist city here in Washington, D.C. And our nonprofits, and our philanthropies, and our corporations, and, our, and, and first and foremost, our governments have to, have to understand what it means to be anti-racist uh, and com commit to that. And I think, that's, I think that's the journey we are on now, and I think that's the opportunity that's presented itself is that, you know, one of the things I've been saying about here in D.C., and I've been really worried about our policymakers here, is I don't think they'll ever have a better opportunity to do the most progressive things they can do. You know, you can only accomplish so much in a finite amount of time, but this is a time when anybody who is looking to, to um, build on the dreamer's dream of the 1960s, this is the time to do it and that there is... Um, so much support. I mean, a recent study in D.C. said that 83% of taxpayers believe that, 83% um, uh, of voters, rather, in D.C. believe that it is appropriate to increase the taxes for wealthy people in this city. That, you know, that sort of, un even in a liberal city like D.C., you know, when is a policymaker going to get almost the entire city saying, we're willing to do our share? to bring about some kind of economic and social equity. And so that's true in DC. I think it's true in the country. Uh, the other thing I want to say, and this is very tangential, but I feel like it's worth saying every time, those people who are on the streets in this country right now in our city are doing the hard, dirty work of, of political reform, of social reform. It's not pretty. It's, it's, it's ugly work. But if you don't, you know, without that kind of agitation, the 60s wouldn't have had the kind of progress they saw. And this opportunity we have, make no mistake about it, a lot of it is being borne by those people who are willing to literally put their lives on the line to say, we're not moving, we're not stopping until there's some change in this plant, in this country, uh, in this city, and in, in our communities. Amen. Thank you. You know, um, back to what you were saying about um, institutions i um you know I, I couldn't help but think about the ways also uh i think the, the the development community overall like the international development sort of sector um which includes groups you know social justice organizations or institutions are being criticized for being white-led and uh, or just dominated by groups who don't reflect the communities they serve. And so I, you know, I, I didn't want to lose that recommendation, the very poignant one that you made earlier in your remarks, that change does start with us individually. And, you know, I think there's there's so much goodwill in our in our community, in our sector to say, what can we do to help? It's like, well, you can help yourself, right? Like there's a lot that can be done at home. That's right. So I want that to sit with folks. Um, but also, you know, just there's so much you had in what you said, George, and, you know, another piece of this, and it relates to a question we received um, about intersections, right? Like, and I, you know, those of us who do, who've been doing this work, y'all who've been doing this work more, you know, robustly than I have, um, can, I think, speak to the fact that it's not often not just a race issue or question, but as we've seen with the COVID crisis and with other issues, it's about race and poverty or race and gender. And so I'd love for each of you to speak to that as well. I think George, starting with you, really, really tackling this question of intersections. Um, and perhaps I think the, the questioner just asked in terms of, you know, speaking openly, but I, I think specifically, I wonder how you resolve that or whether there is a, um, you know, oftentimes I find we're asked to choose, um, just like we're asked to choose an identity. I think we're also asked to choose you know, a service priority 
which one we tackle first. There is enough room to talk about, all, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, and also address like the Poor People's Campaign and advance that agenda. And I, I think some of us would argue actually we can hold both of those glasses of water. But do you have a response in that? Uh, yeah, and and you know, it it, it isn't necessarily the most um, politically correct one, but I, I do think it. But I do think it is. I do think that there is some something redeeming about my perspective and about many people's perspective, which is that. Uh, when you focus on race, um, the intersections that people oftentimes worry about or, or, or identify with, uh, whether it be gender or non-conforming gender or um, um, poverty, income status, or whether it is, um, um, you know, any other kind of oppression that, and you've probably heard this before, that it is multiplied for people of color. Uh, and so that's part of the that's part of the reason why focusing on anti-black uh, racism is, to some degree, the most um, you know most if, if strategic thing to focus on. Even if it weren't, even if we weren't the most oppressed people, and I guess technically we're not, because certainly Native Americans are more oppressed, really, in this country. But but the bottom line is that that if you're going to uh, if you're going to be effective in moving the, the, the social justice needle in this country in particular, but in the world in general, is to focus on anti-Black racism isn't a way to sort of lift all boats because one, there's an intersection between, you know, so Black gay people uh, and Black gender non-conforming, Black people living in poverty, Black people who, forget that, Black people who are CEOs, I mean, you're going to find that the outcomes for them are going to be worse than any other group who also might be uh, in that sort of subset of identities. Uh, and so, so that's the, that's the, that's the truth. It is the reason why Bread for the City focuses on that. It's also the reason we focus on it is because the only people uh, who live in poverty in D.C. essentially are, are not, not are people of color and disproportionately black people. And so here locally, when you talk about poverty, and you talk about oppression, you're really talking about black people uh, by and large. So that's that. But the other piece of it is that history, and this is just the flip side of it, is that history has shown us that uh, some, to some degree, sort of to, to, to a little bit to my chagrin, is that when uh, more justice is delivered for black people or achieved, that probably is a better way to put it, achieved by black people, that other groups succeed and, and benefit from that, women in particular, white women in particular. Uh, and so, and I, you know, there's a part of me that doesn't begrudge that because, you know, we all want justice. But I guess my point is, if you are a person who feels oppressed, you should know that when black people are treated better, we, everyone gets treated better. That when we, when we fight for justice, when we, when we point out wrongs, when we um, create new realities in our communities, uh, people benefit in general. Uh, and I think history bears that out. It is why it makes sense for, for, for there to be a coalition of folks who get behind the anti-Black racism because I think okay. it will make a difference in the quality of, the, of, of life in this country and in the world in general. Thanks, George. I appreciate that. Tanya, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm so happy George, um, George said it. Um, it is, it's absolutely the case for the United States and globally. Like this is where these connect, these intersections of local, international um, ring true. Uh, if we focus on anti-Black racism globally, then we, we focus on the, the cause and the case for all people. Um, and, and, and I heard, and I've seen the sign that uh, all lives, when Black lives matter, all lives will matter. And so it, again, it's, it's to those same points. George also made a point earlier that I wanted to, to touch on around sort of the reckoning, holding, hold us to account, the reckoning of the United States, but also the reckoning of what colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade uh, and all of those disruptions did to, uh, uh, to black people throughout the diaspora. So that's, that's what I wanted to mention about that. The other thing I wanna say that I think makes this conversation um, so important and significant for me 
um, is for all of the international experiences that I listed, in most of those cases, I was the only one. You know, I was the only one who was participating, chosen, uh, sitting at the table, um, you know, as an, and, and I am an African-American. Uh, my family is eight generations up from slavery that we've been able to trace back to. So I am, I am, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an African-American. I'm not from the Caribbean or somewhere far. My parents were slaves on, enslaved on this soil here. Um, but I got connected to international development because I had a professor who um, one said, I was a participant in Model United Nations. Again, there are so many things that are full circle for me here. And I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. And he said, Tonia, um, we, there are lots of lawyers out there. We need more, uh, more African-Americans to be diplomats and to go into international development. But it was, a, it was an affirmative action program that uh, USAID um, had put forth as a pilot in partnership with HBCUs around the country. I'm an Aggie, I went to North Carolina A&T State University. And they worked with four HBCUs in the South to choose uh, best and brightest students who had an interest in international development to spend time in two USAID missions, uh, one in, in Sri Lanka, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and the other in Nepal. And I got selected, I got chosen for that. But I, 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 and I'm, I'm making the point of, you know, a decision to proactively, affirmatively recruit and identify and create a pipeline for people in spaces where we don't, uh, where we typically aren't, is still an important uh, thing for you know, for the international development community to pursue. It's just not enough to say, oh, there aren't enough, there aren't that many, um, you know, we can't find them. Like those things are so not the truth. Um, we have to be very- Look at us, clever. here we are. <laughs> Absolutely. You're Absolutely. Right so again, I'm just, I'm just here to say and to bear witness that when we turn our attention to, uh, to you know, inclusion and equity, then you can get the results that you see. I mean, that, that, that I'm, I'm living proof of it, very proud of it. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that it was an affirmative action program because I think that word has gotten a bad reputation. Um, but had it not been for that effort, I would have not been introduced to this, this, this world of international development that I've spent 20 plus years just loving, enjoying, affecting change and hoping to return to one day. Um, but it's, it's just important that we not lose sight that the struggles that we're seeing here play themselves out in, in development spaces unless we do something different. That's powerful, man, really. And I couldn't agree more. I am also a testament to being plucked out. And I just, my goal is to keep that door open behind me, you know, <laughs> to make sure we can just fill that pipeline as much as possible. Um, I, I recognize we're, we're coming up on time. I know Una's actually still with us just on the phone. So I think I'll start to close things out, starting with her. Um, really, I mean, I have to say, I really enjoyed this conversation. It looks like others have as well from the chat box. And I have to apologize. I haven't gotten to everyone's questions. I'm glad that people sent in so many. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't get to all my questions either. Um, but I think the last one I have for the panelists is to really offer, I mean, it's sort of cliche, right? But it's, you know, what it, what is the real call to action? And specifically, you know, given where we started and where we are, there's, there's UNANCA, you have this, you know, group of people who are online and who are really feeling this conversation. You know, the leadership is, is strong and on board. I think folks are ready to take some sort of action. And I'm mindful that we as black people don't want to be the teachers all the time of this. Um, um, so, um, you know, uh, maybe it's a matter of, of, of asking if you could wave a magic wand um, and, and have one thing change or one thing that this chapter takes on uh, with regards to this issue of racism, what would it be? Can we start with you? Well, 
I will see if Una can come in with that response because I know she'd have a fiery one. But um, I'll take it back to, uh, to George and then we'll come back to Tonia. Well, you know, I, I tend to give this answer to almost every time you, you didn't ask you at the question exactly the same way, but one of the questions of the day, uh, particularly coming from our white brothers and sisters is what can I do? Uh, and actually the answer that I think uh, for anybody who wants to be a part of, of uh, racial justice, racial equity, the answer is the same really, wh whether you're white or any other uh, identity, which is first you need to understand, you need a racial equity analysis. If you haven't had a real full racial equity analysis, it will be difficult to understand and to connect the dots on why so many of the things that we are advocating for, whether it's um, reparations or affirmative action or um, housing as a right, or all the things that we're arguing for will make sense. Uh, you may not agree with it because it's painful, particularly for white people to, to go through the process of understanding how racism has been socialized and, and, and we can do and you know i think that uh, and i, I didn't, certainly didn't coin this term that we that to some degree we've been asleep that that people are finally woke uh on this issue and i think that literally the, the we've been asleep from 1968 to you know uh, for us at breath of the city it was 2012 when trayvon martin was killed when we realized and i was challenged in my own organization to figure out why is race such a, cor a variable and correlation to people who are living in poverty? I mean, we hadn't asked that, ourselves that question and everybody in my organization now goes through a racial equity analysis because what they need to understand is there is an intersection between race and almost every other issue we deal with at Breath of the City that if you don't understand it, you will be working at cross purposes when you're trying to address this. You'll be doing things like blaming people for where they are and trying to fix them and thinking that if they just worked a little harder or yeah, had things would get better mm -hmm. all those things and so but to understand why those old sort of ideas about why racism persists you have to go through this i think first and foremost you have to go through yeah of your own. yeah that's that's helpful thank you and i know una's back on and has uh, you know some more thoughts on complacency that she wanted to share as part of, part of her takeaway una go ahead i want to make sure everybody can hear me can you hear me yes ma'am we can thank you no, i'm having the worst having go oh, so sorry but i'm really loving hearing this conversation it's been so enlightening and just so it just got my soul on fire but yes, I was making sure that in case my mic didn't work, I was typing some things in the chat. I think that, and I'll try to make this brief, that we need to recognize our potential and really educate ourselves and not stay complacent with the status quo. I think that the racially and economically elite take advantage how people like to stay complacent. We all each have a special gift and our own power, and we have to tap into that power in order to do what we need to do to help make the world a better place. Everybody has their own talent. Everybody has their own drive. And I think that if we all just tap into that and pour into that, we can all do our part to driving our future forward. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Nelson. Tonya, go ahead. Yeah, it's so hard oh, to come sorry. behind. It's so hard to come behind Una. I love her energy. Um, and I would just say, you know, get behind smart, high energy people like Una, um, who will chart the path um, for us to follow. One, two stay the course. Um, you know, I have, I can bear witness to sort of this, the surge energy, the surge fundraising. Um, what I'm going to say is that to, we, we're going to get a lot done in the, in the immediate term, but we're going to need people to stay with us for the, the longer term so that we can really make the, the transformational changes um, that we 
uh, that we're capable of. And um, I'd say use your influence and fund the movement. You know, um, it's really time for us to, to put our money where, where our mouth is and get behind people and organizations that are doing the work. Love it. But I don't, I don't have anything else to say except thank you <laughs> to each of you. I am so grateful that I got to sit on a panel with you. And uh, P.S., I have admired each of you from afar um, without you knowing it. So I'm glad that um, I finally get to make your acquaintance and just be um, blessed to be on this virtual stage sharing this moment with all of you. I've learned and gained a lot, not just in mind, but in heart. Uh, so with that, I want to um, pass things back to uh, our hosts at UNA NCA and thank um, Stephen Bala for um, offering uh, the stage this time uh, for such an incredible discussion. Appreciate you. Thanks so much to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lois. Thank you, George. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you, Una. Um, what a what a striking panel. I, I was so taken aback by listening to how you integrated and related the international and the domestic and thinking of my career moving back and forth across 80 countries. You begin to see the U.S. differently if you can step out of it and then come back and vice versa. I think you know, so much is been done on in Georgia's organization, which I've visited a couple of times, to see an extraordinary work on the ground in action over a long period of time make a difference. And you wish you could bring that kind of grassroots NGOism into some of the international programs. We sometimes have a great deal of frustration for NGOs that aren't as effective as some of the things that are known here. So thank you all. What an extraordinary panel. Um, and thank you, Lois, for making it more extraordinary by making it a conversation. Um, we're going to turn a little differently now in our program. We have about um, 20 minutes left, and we're going to move into more of the business, although the business of UNA NCA is the substance of what we've been doing for the last half an hour and is the substance of what we will be doing further in the year to come and years to come. Um, let me turn now and introduce um, Sultana Ali. Sultana is a communication specialist. She's a member of our board, uh, director of communications. She's also um, Director of Communications for the Pew Charitable Trust Organization. And this year she agreed wonderfully to um, chair the nominations committee for our board nominations process this year. So, Tana, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Stephen. It's really difficult to follow such an excellent panel. I was really enjoying the discussion. And Una, I think, you know, we talked about the future and you were definitely the future. So I was really enjoying all of the the comments and remarks from, from all the participants. So thank you, Lois, for moderating such a great discussion. Um, diversity is certainly, diversity and inclusion is certainly at the heart of what we're looking at for the future for the organization. As we undertook uh, the, the nominations process and looking to elect the next generation of board leaders, um, some of the things that we were thinking about and considering was uh, diversity and inclusion, as well as skill set, looking for background and experience that would augment the different areas that we really need as a, as a very slim but efficient nonprofit organization, as well as uh, considering international organizational experience. Obviously, the heart of our work um, directly correlated with the SDGs, with UN goals, um, and we have our programs and priorities through those programs, as well as the edu educational programs that are so important to our work. So we really dove deep. Um, and I want to say a special thank you to the nominating committee, which is a diverse group of members. Uh, Rajesh Gupta, Brian Heilman, Manuela Hernandez, Lauren Terrell, Laura Blyler, and of course, Stephen Mosley and Paula Boland. Uh, there were a lot of conversations. I think we had maybe nine calls all, all together as a nominations committee and had some really candid um, and open discussions and also want to thank everybody that put their names forward um, for the process or nominated folks for us to consider. Uh, we went through a lot of applications and came up with a really great slate and I'm so proud um, to announce the slate of new candidates and if we're not going to have time, unfortunately, for the new board members to make comments. But what I would like to ask is, as I call your name, just to um, sh let your video show if you can, 
so we can see your faces. Hopefully the technology allows that. If it doesn't, then um, just know that we're congratulating you. Normally you would all line up and stand at the front of the room. Um, so this is just gonna be a virtual congratulations and a virtual applause. Um, so I'd first like to start with our directors at large, the ones who have been reelected and are continuing their terms. Patricia Benike, Renee Doplik, Michael Anya, excuse me, Michael Anya, Lem I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name. <laughs> Michael Anya Melueque, and Richard Ponzio. Uh, so those are our continuing board members. Thank you so much for continuing your service. We're looking forward to continuing to engage with you uh, over the next um, term, your next three-year term. Uh, we have added new at-large board members to fill the vacancies on our board. And those are as follows. Supriya Bailey, Ambassador Stephen McCann, Audrey Park, and Aaron Sean Poynton. So congratulations to all of our at-large directors. Uh, and now we have our officers. So this was a very important year because whenever you're looking for a board chair elect, uh, it's always a, an important process because you're thinking about the vision for the board moving forward. Um, so we'll start with our board chair elect, which is Jill Christensen. I think we'll hear from her today. Uh, our vice chair of advocacy, Gayatri Patel. Um, continuing for another term in her role is our vice chair and secretary, Don Calabia. And the chair of our advisory council, really co-chair, is Ted Pichone and he will be joined by Nancy Donaldson. They will be co-chairing the advisory council. Ted will be serving um, in the capacity uh, on, our, on our actual board since there's only one board slot and Nancy Donaldson will be co-chairing that. So thank you to everybody for um, all of our new board members. Congratulations, we are so delighted to have you on board and looking forward to working with you uh, over the next term. And then I'll hand it back to Stephen and Paula. I have to unmute myself. Okay. okay, somebody else has to start my video. Um, okay, I'll say that. We'll see what happens. You need to start my video. The host has to ask you to start your video. Start my video, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I, there was one person whose name, very importantly, I missed. Apologies. Nursena Oktim, our new student representative. So thank you to Una Nelson for serving. Thank you to Nursena Oktim for, for uh, raising her hand. She's going to be the student representative on our board. And apologies for omitting you there. That's good. I'm glad you remembered that. Yeah. I wanted to um, also say that there's another group of people that I have the opportunity to thank, and that's the outgoing board members. Um, who had finished their terms and therefore were not really running for election. Um, they are excellent people and um, I'm hopeful that a number of them are going to continue in a capacity of serving as advisory council members after, the, after today when their term runs out as a board member. Those are Lynn Pasco, Kim Weichel, who has been a wonderful chair for our advisory council, um, Heather Lane Chawney, Diane Adams, Michael Walsh, Ona Nelson, although she's into a new role in the National Council, um, Ellen McGovern, and Melissa Wolf. All of them, I thank you for your long service on the board and the excellent work that you put in. And I know many of you and all of you will continue to be members of the association and participate in programs on an ongoing basis. And this organization, when you leave the board and complete your terms, it just means that we're looking at you to see if there isn't another role that you'd like to play. And quite a number of those people have already indicated that. So thank you very, very much. Um, I won't try to name all the other continuing board members who do not need to stand for election, who are continuing in their terms and as officers and as other at-large members. So thank you very much. It was a very successful uh, undertaking. And Sultana, thank you for your leadership in making that a successful. Um, uh, approach to renewing our capacity and enhancing our diversity and bringing in a huge set of new um, outside experiences into the board. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'd now like to um, and thank you for mentioning um, also that uh, Nancy Donaldson 
while not a board elected person, is an appointed person from all of us on the board to go into that role as co-chair for the advisory council. Um, next though, I would like to in fact take a few moments to welcome Jill Christensen to say a few words to us as she joins me and Paula to make a transition over the coming year. It's called chair elect. Um, maybe she doesn't know that yet, but at least she's not just in waiting until next year, she's got to join in and start leading the organization. I'm looking very much forward to the year ahead um, to work closely with Jill. Thank you, Jill. I think Jill, you're on mute. All right, thank you very much, Steve. And hello to the United Nations Association National Capital Area members. Truly, that is our absolute strength. Think about who we have heard from this afternoon with our panel of expertise reflecting multiple sectors and in fact, that whole thing of our reach. You know, one of my goals as I move into this chair elect position one year before becoming your chair is really, really to look at how we can continue to build in and bring in more and more of who we are to ensure that the United Nations Association, the National Capital Area, is as a nimble, strong, efficient organization that also then is fully inclusive and addressing social justice and anti-racism issues. We've really got to build in that and make a point of doing that. With that, you see, we've got a lot of wisdom within us already and pulling on, in fact, our collective strength. We're strong financially as well as structurally. So with that, I pledge over the coming year to learn by listening, by being a part of, being fully engaged, giving my time, my focus, as well as in sharing of my network. And with that, then, I believe that we will grow better and stronger in, as we do this. Take a moment, you know, our virtual lives here in COVID-19, everything has changed. And I think that sometimes our virtual events, we don't have that follow-up time that we need to. Take a moment, take time to read the annual report. And with it, the Global Classrooms Report. It's a wonderful reflection of the huge numbers of activities and of quality that this little association plays in order to enhance and push the United States and stay deeply involved in the United Nations. We've got quite a year ahead. This is a lot of opportunity. But also then, thus far, it's been wonderful to see how very nimble this association is as we move with it. So as we work on translating the United Nations and our daily lives, translating the UN into our kitchen table conversations, our daily lives as to how it relates to the international realm. We've got a lot to do. I was so impressed earlier when we heard George Jones say, we all have to start at home. UNANCA, let's keep going. Let's move it ahead. Let's do it wisely, pulling together so many others around us. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much. I think they're still trying to figure out how to get me back onto video. Uh, what, and I don't know whether I have to do anything or not. Um, there I am. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're coming to the end of the program. I don't think I could have been more excited to find that it's possible to have a personal in-depth discussion, debate, encouragement for the future by listening to each other and talking with each other on a virtual basis. I guess I've always known that. Um, in the international realm, sometimes you couldn't even talk by phone across the barriers, um, but now we're all in a place where we can all be part of the same process from different positions. Um, this has been a remarkable year, as Paula laid out. I think the year ahead is going to be even more remarkable because there's so much for us to do. And if we have ever uh, proof of the reason for the United Nations and the USA, the United Nations Association of the USA and of the UN itself, um, but for us in the international capital area, which is such an important perch from which to advocate and to bring people together from across the country, UNA, NCA has so much important work to do in the year ahead. In fact, tomorrow morning, um, 
several of us are in virtual meetings to advocate to our congressional representative. I have the good fortune and a couple of other people to speak with my own representative, uh, Mr. Raskin. Um, he's always been supportive and today actually spoke out as a member of the Judiciary Committee on the challenges ahead to try to bring about um, fair and just justice um, for Blacks across America. Very outspoken and supportive of the Human Rights Council meeting debate at the Security Council. It's been so important to see calling past, calling to responsibility, calling for accountability among all nations to address African heritage and the heritage that people receive unjust treatment um, in their homes, in their health, in their employment, in their opportunity. And so I'm already very pleased that uh, my own congressman is very keen on international work, even though that's not been his primary focus. Our focus for the coming year will be to continue many of those same programs that Kyle highlighted as our education programs, our significant efforts in the pillars of uh, peace and security, of international law, of justice, of sustainable development, sustainable development goals, but also advocacy has risen so high on our agenda that we will be spending a lot more time contacting not only our representatives on the Hill in this town, in Congress and in the Senate, um, but also reaching out to the representatives of our own three state or three area jurisdiction um, to talk to them about these issues to make sure that the future representatives of the state of Virginia, of Maryland, here in the district, are also attuned to our common interests in seeing the, uh, the the work that can be done sharing between global justice issues and local justice issues and racial issues and issues about democracy um, across those spectrums. So we begin that this week with jointly with representatives from the 200 chapters across the country because we set forth our programs in all of those uh, areas and ways in which we deliver <laughs> services. Um, the really three principal objectives that I see for all of our advocacy and programs in the months and years ahead for UNA NCA. Some of them were already touched on by Jill's looking at the future. First is to fully recognize that our mission and role at UNA NCA is to renew our pledge for our country and its people and citizens to fully support the critical role of the UN together with other national leaders to give compassionate support and help to all of those affected by the COVID pandemic which will be with us in its aftermath for many years and periods to come. Second, to fully recognize and vow to stop the systemic unequal treatment and discrimination that we've just been talking about that prevents people of color, black, brown, and often other ethnic groups from the opportunity to prosper in good health, stable environment, decent housing, and leadership roles in all of our businesses and national and community leadership roles in every country, including here in the Washington area. And third, that we devote our UNA NCA to build bridges and commitment to meet the needs of the most impoverished in our local communities, in countries around the world, and to address urgently the now 100 million people, over 100 million people who have been displaced from their homes, the highest in history, and who need asylum from terror or in desperate need to avoid death from war and starvation, as we're seeing in Yemen today. This virus has been a wake-up call to respect multilateral cooperation. And I emphasize those, both multilateral and cooperation, not national, international, independent leadership to save millions of lives going forward. The UN Secretary General said it beautifully in his comment before the special session of the Security Council on Human Rights review of the violence and injustice to all people, African, Blacks, descents, and other people of color. He said, lasting peace and sustainable development can only be built on the equality and human rights and dignity of everyone. So we're gonna end this by just simply saying, I'm so pleased that you took the time to come together. We're expecting to be able to continue to move virtually through many programs to the balance of the fall. Maybe we'll have a chance to anoint new programs even before the end of the year outside of the virtual work. But I think there's plenty of us, plenty willing, plenty ready to work together and collaborate in a virtual process of addressing these issues. So I thank all of you, our members, our colleagues, our board members, and I thank Paula 
um, for her continuing leadership as we move forward together. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.